Um, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Rob Montoya. I'm the director of California Rare Book School. Um, it's my first year um, with the program and um, my first summer uh, directing the various classes that have been going on these past three weeks. And so um, uh, it's been a really exciting time for me as well. Uh, so first, I have a few people to thank. And I think first and foremost, uh, Sam Regal, uh, CalRPS project manager, who has really went above and beyond to make um, not only this lecture, but the entirety of the summer program function. So thank you, Sam. Uh, this is our third week of California Rare Book School. And so uh, this is the third kind of group of faculty that I wanted to thank. Um, it's a difficult task to plan courses for an online environment, particularly for California Rare Book School, right? That, that is usually so dependent on um, materials. And so um, I thank all faculty and of course to the participants um, I want to thank uh, our, our many, our dozens and actually hundreds of donors this year that made it possible to give out more scholarships than we have ever been able to. And actually, um, comprehensively, Summer 2021 has been the largest cohort of participants. So um, thank you to everybody for, for that. Um, and so with that, I kind of want to just jump right into the task at hand. Um, so today we have uh, TK San Juan. Sangwand uh, from the UCLA Library here um, as our third and final, final speaker in the 2021 CalRBS Speakers Series. Um, TK is a certified archivist, librarian, and DJ, an all around awesome person. Uh, she's currently the librarian for digital, digital collection development at UCLA Library and holds an MLIS and an MA in Latin American Studies from UCLA. Over the past 12 years, she has worked at both UCLA and UT Austin to build preservation partnerships for human rights documentation and cultural heritage materials in the US, Latin America, Africa, and Asia. In 2017, she was named a Fulbright Specialist in Library and Information Science. And in 2018-19, she was a Fulbright Scholar with Mexico's Ministry of Culture. She is currently a 2020, uh, 2020 to 2022 Rare Book School Mellon Foundation Cultural Heritage Fellow. And since 2021, TK has worked in a community radio and currently hosts the program, The Archive of Feelings on dublab.com. That is D-U-B-L-A-B.com. And I'm here to say it's pretty amazing. So um, look out for that. Uh, so with that, uh, TK's title is Prison Libraries, Indigenous Typography and Experimental Publishing, Reflections on Radical Publishing um, in CDMX or Mexico City. Uh, so uh, just really quickly, we'll go, we're planning on only going for one hour. Uh, please, if you have any questions for the question and answer session after the talk, place them in the chat and Sam Regal will moderate those questions at the end. Um, but uh, without further ado, I pass it to you, TK, and thank you for participating. All right. Thank you, Rob. I am just going to start sharing my screen right now, so bear with me for one sec while I go into present mode. All right. Um, I am assuming everyone can see unless someone tells me otherwise. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. It's so good to be with you all today uh, for the CalRBS lecture series. Uh, thanks to Rob for the invitation, and thank you all so much for taking the time to be here today. I know we've been having some really long days on Zoom, so I appreciate all the extra effort to be here. And as Rob said, uh, my name is TK Sangwan. I am based in Los Angeles, California, and thus I am a settler occupying, occupying the unceded land traditionally known as Tovangar. I want to uplift and honor any indigenous folks in the space who are the original guardians of these lands. And I encourage other settlers to learn more about which indigenous lands you occupy and how to redistribute settler resources to directly support local indigenous groups. So, my talk today will reflect on some of the major themes and lessons from the Radical Publishing in Mexico City speaker series that I curated in 2020 to 2021 that was sponsored by the Bibliographical Society of America and UCLA Library. But before I delve into that, I want to give you a little bit more context on where I'm coming from. Um, I want to be clear, I'm 
very new to the rare books field. Uh, as someone who knew I wanted to work in special collections, I've always had a curiosity about rare books and I dipped my toe into RBMS at the beginning of my career, but I never quite felt like it was for me. And I knew that I wanted to work with collections that documented subaltern experiences and rare books didn't seem to be a field that really valued those experiences. Um, and as someone with an academic training in contemporary Latin American studies and not canonical Western literature and history, I figured it would be difficult to pursue a career in her books. And so I focused my professional uh, uh, specialization towards archives. So I am trained as an archivist, and over the past decade, my career has really focused on building transnational post-custodial relationships with human rights and cultural heritage organizations and in the Global South. And as a memory and information worker, my philosophy is that we all have the responsibility to ground our work in social justice-based practices, recognizing that this will look necessarily different depending on where we're situated in the field. And for me, in practice, this looks like helping to facilitate conditions where people can tell and preserve their own histories and also working towards redistributing resources more equitably. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, I'm particularly grateful for the Rare Book School and Mellon Fellowship, which has given me the opportunity to develop more knowledge of rare books and print culture more broadly. And I'm really excited that Rare Book School and Cal RBS has made such significant strides to diversify their curriculum and instructors that focus on subaltern experience. And I'm also really excited to see that there are groups such as the book Print Artists Scholars of Color Collective that are changing the scholarship dynamic within the rare books field. So seeing these shifts in the field made me feel more optimistic about the receptivity of programming uh, for events such as radical publishing in Mexico City um, that really challenged the Western and Eurocentric dominance that's found in rare books. And so I'm hopeful that programming efforts such as these may attract and encourage new folks in the field to explore and expand critical possibilities within the rare books field. So that context, let's get into it. Uh, so I'll share about how the series came about, the primary reasons for creating the series, how we implemented a language justice framework, the specifics of the talks themselves, as well as the lessons and themes across the series that I found to be most energizing and salient. And I'll end with some questions that I hope um, may guide some of our future work in the field. So um, just to get a sense of who's in the room, can I get a show of hands of people who attended one of the radical publishing events? Awesome. Um, is there anyone who attended all four of them? <laughs> Shout out to Rob, thanks for that. Okay, cool. Well, hopefully it's not too redundant um, and it went, hopefully it's a good refresher. Uh, so we had four events in the series. The first one kicked off with Diego Flores Magón of Casa de Aguizote, and he gave a talk on the textual legacy of Mexican anarchists, the Flores Magón brothers, and the influence they had from Mexican revolution to the current day. Um, our second talk was with uh, E. Tonatiu Trejo from Esto es un Libro, and he discussed experimental publishing in Latin America. Our third talk with, was with Sol Arechiga Mantilla, who is the founder of Ormiguero Editorial, and she discussed collective translation and typography for indigenous languages. And our fourth talk was with the collective RRD, and they discussed site-specific textual interventions and distribution methods. So I'll obviously give more detail about each of those talks later, but just to give you an overview. Um, I want to give you some context for how this series came into place. Um, in late 2019, the Associate University Librarian for Special Collections at UCLA, Sharon Farb, uh, was in conversation with the Director of Special Collections, who at the time was Athena Jackson, as well as uh, with the La Librarian for Latin American Studies, Jennifer Osorio, about uh, diversifying the artist book collections at UCLA. And so in order to do that, they decided to allocate a significant portion of the budget to uh, purchase books from artist books from Latin America, beginning in Mexico. And so in order to start to kick off this initiative, 
Jenna Sorio proposed doing an acquisition strip and attending the Index Art Book Fair in Mexico City in 2020. And that's the point that I was brought in. Um, I have extensive experience in Mexico City. I was a Fulbright Scholar in 2018 and 2019, so I built a lot of connections during my time there. Uh, but I also have past experience as a bibliographer doing acquisition trips in Latin America from my previous position at UT Austin. Um, so having these connections, I was able to organize an itinerary that included not only the Index Art Book Fair, but also the Replica Book Fair, as well as studio visits with small art and experimental publishers. And Jen and I made really great connections with folks during that trip, and we started brainstorming about how we might collaborate with them and bring them to UCLA. However, this was all in February 2020, and we all know how the rest of 2020 went down. So luckily through my RBS Mellon Fellowship, I was connected to the Bibliographical Society of America who generously had offered us free membership, which came with the benefit of applying for event funding. And so building on these existing relationships with folks and the new relationships we cultivated through the trip, um, I proposed the Radical Publishing in Mexico City speaker series, which was generously funded by the BSA and an anonymous donor. And so this funding enabled us to pay the speakers as well as hire simultaneous interpreters for both Spanish and English for all of the events. So, as I mentioned, I'm new to the rare books field, and so it's possible that I don't know the best places to look. But as a rare books outsider, I have not found much programming that highlights contemporary Latin America. Most programming on contemporary rare books that I've seen seems to highlight US and European works, and programming on Latin America tends to focus on pre-colonial and colonial objects. So as such, my goal for the speaker series was really to highlight transnationalism and bibliographic studies from a Global South perspective and tie this bibliographic history to the current socio-political context, which I think and I hope that we accomplished. I also thought it was really important to hear directly from Mexicans in Mexico in a moment when there is and was a lot of anti-immigrant, anti-Mexico discourse within the US. So to that end, I adopted a language justice framework for the speaker series that would enable invited speakers to communicate in the language they feel most comfortable in. And despite all the invited speakers having the ability to speak English, they all appreciated the opportunity to speak in a language that's most comfortable. And it is a good, I think it's a good exercise as well for monolingual English speakers to experience some of the discomfort of not speaking the dominant language in the room, which is a common experience for many people in this country. So all the talks are available in the original language in addition to having versions with English and Spanish interpretation. They're available through the Bibliographical Society of America YouTube channel, so you can check it out there. Uh, if you are bilingual though, I highly encourage you to watch the presentations in the original languages as you will really get the depth of what the speakers are saying there. And this is not to malign the interpreter's work, but as someone who also does simultaneous interpretation, I know how challenging it is to capture faithful interpretations in the moment, particularly when discussing technical, theoretical, or literary matters. Um, and I just wanted to share this quote from our first speaker, Diego, because I thought it was really important how he highlighted the importance of using a language justice framework for events when possible. So before delving into the specifics of each presentation, um, I'll highlight some of the important themes that I want to draw out from the talks and that I found particularly energizing. And at the end, I would really love to hear from all of you if how these themes might tie into other aspects of the rare book field and what you think would be worth exploring more. So across all the presentations, the speakers demonstrated some form of transcending or breaking down barriers and borders, be it linguistic, borders imposed by a nation state, or breaking through to elite, elitist worlds or out of elitist worlds such as high art. You'll also notice that none of the speakers represent or conduct their work in the context of a large academic or governmental institution. They work relatively autonomously or have strategic institutional partnerships when necessary. So along with this theme of breaking down borders comes examples of global South-South solidarity that's born out of a shared experience of colonization, capitalism and repressive governments. And through this solidarity, we also see a prioritization of relationships over products and objects. And within this relationship building, we also see efforts to build multi-generational as well as cross-class and cross-cultural connections and collaborations. 
And while each project does make their materials available for purchase, commercialization is not the driving force behind production of objects. And lastly, one of the most salient themes was how pleasure and play are an essential part of creative praxis, which is something that I don't think we get to discuss enough. So those are the themes that I'll aim to tease out across the talks, and I'll get into that right now. Oops. There we go. So the series kicked off with Diego Flores Magón, who is the founder and director of Casa del Aguisote, a museum and printing space located in downtown Mexico City. <coughs> I wanted to start with Diego because of his family's longstanding history with radical printing in Mexico City prior to the Mexican Revolution in 1910 and how that history has continued to be influential throughout the 20th century through the current day. So Diego Flores Magón is the great grandson of Enrique Flores Magón, the brother of Ricardo Flores Magón. And the Flores Magón brothers were two notable Mexican anarchists and their importance not only to Mexican history, but also for US radical history and Chicano history cannot be overstated, especially for audiences outside of Mexico. Whereas it would be unheard of for anarchists to be celebrated on the same national level in the US, there are numerous public sites, metro stops, streets, neighborhoods across Mexico that are named after the Flores Magón brothers and really speaks to the importance of their place in, in history. So Diego is preserving this family legacy through his stewardship of the family library and archive. And in addition to this, he takes on many editorial projects related to reissuing family texts, creating facsimiles, and collaborating with other creative and radical print projects. And the current day location of Casa de Aguizote is actually founded in the original location of the Flores Magón Brothers printing press for their original publication, El Hijo de la Aguizote. And as you can see, uh, this is the same building just over 100 years apart. And so the Flores Magón brothers brand of Mexican anarchism, which is known as Magonismo, is considered to be a precursor to and a major influence of the Mexican Revolution of 1910. And after various arrests in Mexico for protesting the government, the Flores Magón brothers exiled in the US in 1903 and spent a significant amount of time in LA, um, particularly Silver Lake and El Monte, for those of you who know LA neighborhoods. And while in the US, the Flores Magón brothers founded the Mexican Liberal Party and began publishing their subversive newspaper, Regeneración. They befriended and were in solidarity with leftists in the US, uh, such as Emma Goldman and the Wobblies. And they really had built an extensive network of radical folks here uh, while they were in exile here. Um, however, the U.S., fearing a government uh, communist takeover, the U.S. government began to surveil the Flores Magón brothers for their beliefs. And while the Mexican government was unsuccessful in their attempts to extradite Ricardo Flores Magón back to Mexico, the U.S. government did imprison Ricardo multiple times, including here in L.A., and before he was sent to federal prison in Leavenworth, Kansas, where he died in 1922. However, while in prison, uh, Ricardo created a circulating prison library of radical texts and created a quote, university of radicalism where he shared radical ideas and also taught Spanish to fe fellow folks who were in prison. And despite his early death, his writings remain influential and lived on through reprints in Mexico and across Latin America and inspired new generations of leftist activists, including some of the youth who participated in Mexico's student movement of 1968, as well as activists in the US Chicano movement. So Casa de la Huizote maintains this legacy by reprinting key texts as well as new texts with the same anarchist spirit. And one of its most recent printings is a facsimile of the Regeneración newspaper. And somewhat ironically, considering the Flores Magón brothers' uh, years of resistance to the Mexican government, this facsimile was created in, or printed in collaboration with the federal Mexican government, the House of Representatives. And uh, this photo here on the right is actually from the launch of that facsimile. Uh, that actually happened while we were on the acquisitions trip in Mexico City. And you can see Diego here on stage with a handful of Mexican politicians, including the First Lady, 
um, of the current president. So quite, quite a change over the past century. So while Casa del Aguisote's collaborations are too numerous to name here, I do want to highlight that they are continuing the tradition of building these transnational networks. One of their ongoing collaborations is with the South of Monte Arts Posse, and that collaboration shines light on the political connections between Mexico City and El Monte, California, through the history of the Flores Magón brothers. And this collaboration has also created space for contemporary works to engage in new traditions of radical printing, as evidenced by this uh, Burn the Wagon uh, publication that came out and um, was printed by Casa de la Huisote. This is all new works. So, in addition to building these transnational networks, Casa de la Huisote has also initiated a project in a community close to its roots within Mexico. The Flores Magón brothers were born to an indigenous father and a mestiza mother in Oaxaca, a state in southern Mexico with a high indigenous population. And so Diego has returned to his family's community of origin in Oaxaca and began collecting oral histories about the Flores Magón family and printed them with a multi-generational group of community members. And that's what you see depicted here in this image. Together, they have generated a written record of collective memory, and this has been shared outwards with a multi-generational community audience. And while these messages of collectivism and community autonomy are deeply rooted in the histories of the specific community in Mexico, they also deeply resonate with social justice struggles in the US and worldwide. And I think the solidarity that's been cultivated across these national and cultural borders really demonstrates this inherent contradiction of borders as both a fictitious construction, but also one that uh, wields material co consequences for people on both sides of it. So this thread of transnationalism really continued with the second talk um, by Donatiu Trejo, who is the founder of the experimental publishing lab Esto es un libro, uh, which translates to this is a book. He is also the curator of the Biblioteca de Anomalias, or the Library of Anomalies, uh, which features an extensive collection of artist books and experimental publications from across Latin America and the world. And this likely isn't obvious to most people, but the title of Tonatiu's talk obliquely references the Zapatista text by Subcomendante Marcos, Our Word is Our Weapon. And this speaks to the influence of the Zapatista movement on Esto es un libro, which I'll talk briefly about in just a little bit. Oops. Um, okay. So from the beginning of Tonatiu's talk, um, these threads of transnationalism were evident. He chose to open his, his talk by, with quotes from Discourse on Colonialism by a Martinican thinker, Aimé César. Uh, he also included a quote, uh, which I shared here, from the London-based independent publisher and publishing. And the last quote he included was by Subcomandante Marcos, one of the most visible leaders of the Zapatista movement uh, based in, the southern, in Mexico's southern state of Chiapas. Um, so again, I encourage everyone to check out the recordings of the talk so you can get the full richness of the presentation, but I did want to share this particular quote from End Publishing because I really like how it challenges us to put our radical ideas into action. So with that framing quote, Tonatiu started off by describing the work of Esto es un libro as an experimental publishing lab that creates books and objects that challenge traditional reading experiences and show that there are many facets to what we think of as a book. And this is reflected in the many objects that Esto es un libro has produced, and I want to highlight a few of them here um, because he did not have a chance to get into this so much during his presentation. So. The first book that was published by Estus and Libro is called La Inteligencia Militar, or Military Intelligence. This came out in 2012. And this book is originally by the Chilean writer Sergio Pesutic, uh, who came out with this during the Pinochet dictatorship in Chile during the 1980s. And what's curious about this book is that it's blank. And that's purposeful because it speaks to the political silences of this time. And Estos and Libro decided to publish this book um, as a reaction to the, their own 
political realities that they were living in Mexico. And it was published as a statement on the Mexican government's own silences around the human rights violations that were committed or are still being committed by the Mexican military during the so-called war on drugs that really kicked off in like 2008, 2009. So again, very tied to the current sociopolitical context. Um, and that really continues with a later publication that they did um, called Fuerza Aria Zapatista, which came out in 2014. And for those of you who might be unfamiliar, the Zapatista movement is a movement for land and dignity led by indigenous communities in Chiapas, Mexico. And they became visible on a global stage in 1994 when they led a 12 day uprising across Chiapas in protest of the implementation of NAFTA, which endangered the land and livelihood of indigenous communities. And as evidenced by their name, they are the political heirs of the Mexican revolutionary Emiliano Zapata, who formed the Liberation Army of the South in 1911. It's also worth noting that Zapata was a contemporary of the Flores Magón brothers. And while Zapata is often attributed for using the phrase tierra y libertad or land and freedom, scholars actually dispute this and say that Ricardo Flores Magón is responsible for popularizing this phrase in his writing, which is part of the reason why the Flores Magón brothers are considered uh, the precursors to the Mexican Revolution. So here's where we can see how Mexican anarchist radical printing, these antecedents really hold significant residence um, in contemporary struggles. So back to this piece, Fuerza Aria Zapatista. Uh, it consists of a folder that contains five airplanes, paper airplanes, with original text written by Zapatistas. And there's also five blank sheets of paper so the reader can create their own airplane um, and use it to fly across borders. So the story behind this work is in 1999, members of the Mexican army arrived at a collectively run Zapatista farm in Chiapas. And the Zapatistas confronted them upon arrival and tried to dialogue with them, but the military refused to engage. And so the Zapatistas wrote down their thoughts and ideas on paper airplanes and flew them towards the military. And so this is what they ca call their first aerial attack on the military. And it was done solely with words and paper. So again, thinking back to the title that I mentioned earlier about how our word is our weapon and our weapon is really this creative practice or the creative practices that we come up with. So these are just a few of the publications that Esto es un libro has produced. And in addition to producing their own works over the years, uh, Tonatio has curated an extensive collection of books from across Latin America and other parts of the world, which originally served as his own research collection and source of inspiration, but grew to become a collection available to the public at his apartment through appointment. And accompanying the opening of the library space, Tonatio also describes the opening of a conversatorio or a conversation space. And as I hear Tonatio describing his work, it becomes evident that it's the relationships that coalesce around book objects that are really primary and not the objects themselves. And the acquisitions of pieces within the library of anomalies represent the many conversations, relationships, and collaborations. And these objects represent those moments in time in which they took place. So Tonatiu further explicates this as he describes uh, Esto es un libro's journey uh, called Licuar el libro in South America in 2019. And licuar, I guess, loosely translates to liquefy or to deconstruct, uh, to destroy. And during this journey, Tonatiu visits uh, people with like-minded projects in Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay to discuss uh, you know, the politics of information circulation, of publishing, et cetera. And he shares some of the snapshots of these conversations and activities that were generated through these encounters. And it's evident that in sharing these intimate spaces, such as the ones that are also cultivated by the Library of Anomalies and its conversation space, is really what helps foster these deep relationships. And Tonatiu gives a really good example of this, um, of how three book fairs from Latin America decided to change its approach during COVID-19. So the three book fairs are Microtopias from Uruguay, um, the Paraguay book fair, which is actually from Argentina, and the Tijuana book fair, which is actually from Brazil. 
And so instead of trying to recreate a commercial space online for the book fair experience, they decided instead to organize, to organize a conversation space for folks across Latin America to come together and discuss the circulation of ideas and to really build deeper South-South relationships. And again, this is a great example of how these types of projects really prioritize relationship building over the commercialization of the work that they do. So reflecting on this desire to prioritize relationship building during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, when so many of us were isolated, Esto es un libro launched their Colección Biblioteca a la Deriva, or uh, library, derivative library collection, um, which was a portable and DIY version of the Library of Anomalies. So a handful of the texts were that you can find in the library were reproduced on letter sized paper that can be downloaded as a PDF and printed and folded to make a mini zine like version of the text. And so at a time when people could not come into the library and have these conversations and build these relationships, this was a way to hopefully engage folks in some of those conversations, maybe at a distance, and also potentially invite new people to that conversation. And so if you're interested in checking out this particular collection, you can actually do so by going to the Estozon Libro website and they have everything available to download along with these instructions here. So to encapsulate many of the principles based uh, behind these projects, Tonatiu shared a nine point Disposable Experimentalist Manifesto. And again, please go to the original recording so you can hear the whole manifesto. But in the meantime, I just wanna share this point that I found to be particularly salient. And I love this quote because it really emphasizes the, co the collective and horizontal relationship building as a basis for this creative work and focusing on the development of relationships over the accumulation of objects. And this, as I said, is a very common theme throughout the series, um, which I think the next talk by Ormiguero really picks up well. Um, so Sol Arechiga's talk in defense of cognitive territories focused on this horizontal exchange. And Sol is a translator and editor who has had extensive experience working with small publishers and indigenous languages. She was a founding member and printer of Gato Negro before working with the artist collective Crata Invertido and then starting her own press, Ormiguero, which she describes as an exploration of relationships of power between languages. So building on this quote by Yasnaya Hill, uh, Sol shares her experience of co-facilitating translation workshops between Spanish and Purepecha speakers for a multi-generational group of women and girls in Santa Fe de la Laguna, Michoacán. And she reminds us that languages are not just theoretical constructs, but are intimately tied to land and geographies. And that fight to preserve indigenous languages necessarily must include fighting for land autonomy and the epistemologies that are embedded in both land and language. So Santa Fe de la Laguna is historically an important location of resistance within Purepecha communities. And it's important to recognize that this contested struggle of land and language is the larger political landscape um, that the workshop participants inhabit. But what Sol tries to highlight through the translation workshop is that language can also be a refuge, a place of joy, and um, working with language can give us pleasure, which is a political act. And I really love this quote that she shares because it's too rare that we theorize our pleasure and embrace pleasure as a political act. So the workshops that Seoul led uh, focused on the translation of comics, including Little Nemo in Slumberland and a manga by Shigeru Mizuki. And through the translation of comics in this intimate atmosphere of small group of women and girls, the workshop really aimed to create a space that was comfortable and not overly didactic. And through this exercise of translation, which entailed reading aloud a text in Spanish and then collectively deciding on translations and seeing how they went with the images, the participants gained a new consciousness and appreciation of their language as well as themselves and the collective. And as Sol states, La lengua is de quien lo trabaja, 
or language belongs to those who use it. Um, this exercise really uh, validated the linguistic value from within the community as opposed to an external entity. And I think this is an extremely important point when we get to the question of developing typography for works published in indigenous languages. I think it's also important to highlight that while Sol is a professional translator, she is not a Purepecha speaker. She helps facilitate the activities, but as a non-speaker of Purepecha, she is less of an authority in the room, which helps break down some of the hierarchies that exist. And as she says, soy apoyo, pero no doy respuestas, uh, which translates to, I support, but I don't give answers. And I think this is an incredibly helpful way to think about our role whenever engaging in work with communities that are not our own. So after the translation process moves towards putting the translated text um, into the comic book format, it becomes evident that fonts designed for non-tonal languages in Roman script are insufficient for tonal indigenous languages, and that Western publishing conventions are insufficient for translating um, uh, into these contexts. And so some of the main issues which Sol explicates so beautifully are around fonts, their readability, and the genres in which they're applied. And she emphasizes that we really want fonts to help create a pleasurable reading experience. And so she gives some examples of how, um, you know, Western or default fonts that we use really don't work well in, in the indigenous language context. Like we see here, everything is very scrunched together, which makes it difficult to read. Um, and this is a text in Chatino. And then we have this other example of um, Mihe language where there's just a lot of space in between um, the text, which also makes it difficult to read. So I think it's safe to say that the same font is not gonna work for all indigenous languages. And that there are fonts that may work for some languages, but they may only work for certain genres. So ex for example, you can have a font that works for one language in a comic book form, but it's not gonna look so great in a monograph form. So Mexico's National Institute for Indigenous Languages developed a universal font that doesn't work because it tries to be universal for uh, an issue that needs specificity. And as Sol states, there are power relationships that are inherent in design. And the current typography design really shows our ignorance and fear around languages we don't understand. And so she urges us to collectively seek answers in order to devise creative and specific solutions. And in conclusion, Sol asks us to consider why do we work with the languages that we do and for whom? And I think this question is really important and one that extends to ourselves, particularly those of us who work around collection development with rare books. Why do we work with the publications and objects and materials that we do and for whom? So for the last installment of Radical Publishing in Mexico City, the RRD Collective also highlighted these themes of pleasure and play. Um, RRD is a collective consisting of six people that is well known, um, sorry, and they are well known for their unconventional newsstand outside the Juanacatlan metro station in Mexico City. And this new stand carries subversive, experimental, and art publications from across Mexico and Latin America and other parts of the world. So all the types of publications that I've described so far, those are the types of publications you can find at this new stand. Um, they also have a workshop where they print their own publications in addition to creating site-specific installations, both within Mexico City and in other countries in the global south where they have collaborations. And through their work, they propose alternative modes of information circulation and foment distribution of counter information. And while their work has garnered a lot of attention in the art world, they are quick to say that the art world is not their primary audience. And their aim is to engage a much larger audience who may not encounter their work otherwise, which is why the newspaper stand in a highly transited public space plays such an important role in their creative practice. And again, this resonates deeply with the creative praxis of Casa del Aguisote, Jesus Un Libro, and Omiguero, who prioritize building relationships who are outside these traditional worlds of art and publications. Um, and this is, in, this is key to their creative practice. 
So I wanted to share some of the projects that RRD highlighted in their talk that speak to their conceptual orientation. Um, I'll just share a few. And again, I encourage you to check out their talks. So you can hear them discuss it all firsthand. Um, but I wanted to start with the El Mondrigo project because it carries some of the deeper historical political re resonances that I previously discussed. So for example, Ricardo Flores Magón was publishing his work in the early 1900s when the US and Mexico were caught up in this Red Scare and sought to repress and eradicate public expressions of radical thought. So fast forward to Mexico in the 1960s, and the government is doing similar work implementing repressive and violent actions, this time against youth who are engaged in the student movement. There was even a group called the Ricardo Flores Magón Brigade that organized out of the National Autonomous University's Department of Letters and Philosophy, which is known for its radical organizing. And of course, in 1968, the Mexican government committed the most infamous of its violent actions with its massacre of three to 400 people, mainly students. Um, and this occurred in La Plata local neighborhood on the eve of the Olympics in Mexico. And so during this time, of course, the Mexican government tried to cover it up. They didn't want any international bad press during the time of the Olympics. So not only was the Mexican government waging acts of violence, but also a war of ideas, um, which is when this publication, El Mondrigo, or uh, translates to scoundrel, this is when this publication emerges uh, in 1969. So this book was supposedly a diary written from the point of view of a leftist student leader. However, it was actually a covert government publication written with the aim of trying to discredit the movement and justify government repression. And the government printed 100,000 copies of it and then surreptitio surreptitiously distributed it in libraries, bookstores, car windshields, public places. Um, so I think, I guess we can think about this as like a slower circulating version of fake news. Um, RRD found a copy of this book in a used bookstore and decided to print an exact copy, but with targeted interventions at the false information. And so they added visual poetry, they redacted some parts, and they did other sorts of edits. They too printed a lot of copies. Uh, I think they only printed 1,000, not 100,000, um, and redistributed it in similarly covert ways. So they would put it back in old used bookstores, they would give it to street vendors, they would leave uh, copies in public public spaces like cafes. Um, they even drop some in mailboxes in Plata Local, the neighborhood where that government massacre takes place and the neighborhood that's referenced a lot in the original text. So one of the most striking anecdotes um, related to this publication was how an older man, presumably of the 1968 student movement generation, walked by the RD newspaper stand and saw the reproduction and commented about how it was a terrible book. And so this opened up the opportunity for RD to share their innovation with that passerby and have a conversation about the content and the context of, of their work, of their dialogue with this piece. And so RD ended up giving him a book. Um, and so these are really the types of important conversations and relationships that being in public space allows as opposed to operating solely in an art context. And again, RRD's work centers relationships and dialogues um, that can occur because of objects and they don't center the objects uh, or the commercialization of the object in and of itself. The second project I wanna highlight of theirs is Pirata Pacifico uh, because it really exemplifies the transnational global South-South collaborations that we also saw with Esto es un libro. But in this case, RRD expands outside Latin America uh, to collaborate with folks in East and Southeast Asia. And Pirata Pacifico is a transnational global South-South collaboration with participants from Mexico, Taiwan, Brazil, Thailand, Vietnam, and Colombia. And participants were invited to contribute video content of any kind, didn't matter if it was copyrighted or not, if it was theirs or not. And this would be burned to DVD and exhibited in a public space. And then uh, the people who submitted could also include text about why they thought it was significant. So in the style of night markets found across Southeast Asia, RRD collaborated with the group Writing Factory in Taiwan to create a night market type of installation where people can browse the audiovisual materials, and even pay a symbolic amount if they wanna take one home. And these are typically the types of contexts where you would find pirated uh, material like movies or music or what have you. 
Um, RRD also created a miniaturized box form of the miniaturized version of their kiosk, um, which like this is the actual kiosk. They made a little box that looks just like that. And it holds some of the um, pirated materials on DVD if you, so you can like check out some of the stuff that people selected. And when UCLA did our acquisitions trip, uh, we did get a copy of that. So whenever uh, folks can come visit UCLA again, that is something that you can check out in our special collections. Um, so in line with RRD's philosophies of engaging broader publics, experiencing these installations really required interacting and engaging with the work in public spaces, such as the actual RRD kiosk, or in the case of Taiwan, um, they recreated a familiar public space, such as the night market, um, and even did their own pirated version of the RRD kiosk, which you can see here in the back. And that was another way, another space in which people could interact with, um, with this particular work. And this work really highlights the prevalence of piracy in the global South across different contexts and shows how this is really a practice born out of necessity due to the way in which colonial histories have shaped the way information flows. I think what's also great about this piece is that it encourages a viewer to reflect on who and what information should become part of the public domain. And lastly, it also highlights how global affinities and solidarities across national borders can emerge in response to similar shared experiences shaped by colonialism. So lastly, I want to highlight RRD's COVID-19 intervention, which shares similarities with Esto es un libro, and that, uh, in that they both created these sort of like miniature replica pieces. So reflecting on the isolation and the consumerist alienation that followed the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic, RRD created Redex, which is an interactive artistic project that emphasizes creation over consumerism and human connections over social media interactions. And so how this worked was participants received a miniature version of the RRD kiosk, which you can see here. And, um, and those participants were invited to create any sort of artistic intervention that they wanted to. They then had the choice of passing it along to another person to add to that intervention or return it to RRD. And as you can see, uh, RRD playfully pirated the familiar FedEx logo. Um, they called their project Redex and Red in Spanish means network. And this project entailed hand-to-hand -hand delivery, which you can see here in this photo. Um, of it, they did hand-to-hand -hand delivery of these materials, which served as a critique of the global distribution networks built for consumerism. And it emphasized how the circulation, and it emphasized the importance of circulation and not the accumulation of materials. I also particularly appreciate how this project emphasizes reciprocal information networks outside of social media, and it intentionally focuses on collective network building during the moments of the pandemic that emphasize individualism, both in terms of public health debates, as well as the literal experience of isolation and quarantine during the pandemic. So as I hope these examples have demonstrated, radical publishing in Mexico City is imbued with strong values of community collectivity and self-determination. And as scholars and practitioners in the global north, I ask myself, and I want to offer these questions to all of you as well, what can we learn from these rich lessons of transcending borders and engaging in global south solidarity actions? How can we prioritize relationships over products and objects? How can we build multi-generational and cross-class connections and support the urgency of self-representation in post-colonial and neo-colonial contexts? How can play and pleasure become essential aspects of our daily work and our creative practice, especially when we share that collectively? And generally speaking, how do we move from radical thought to action? So those are some of the questions that I hope we can have a conversation about. Thank you. Thank you so much, TK. That was absolutely fascinating and inspiring. I know I have so much to think about. Um, so now uh, we're going to move into our Q&A portion. And as Rob described at the beginning, uh, we're just going to have about 10 minutes for this. But if you can please provide your questions in the chat, I will then read them aloud, pose them, and we can go from there. 
Um, so, you know, questions or if you have responses that you want to share to some of DK's great questions too, those are welcome. Sometimes we need a minute to digest. <laughs> okay, um, we have a question from Zeb. I love the connections between piracy in the global south, forms of embodiment slash knowledge production and political praxis slash pressure as they resonate across time. I'm interested in hearing a bit more about how these forms of horizontal and quote unofficial publishing and printing resonate with earlier networks of knowledge production in Mexico and elsewhere in the Americas in the 19th and early 20th century and or how the focus of pleasure as praxis resonates in other areas of radical publishing in and beyond Mexico. Hi, Seb, that's a great question. Um, as I mentioned, I am not a rare books person. <laughs> so I, I don't have deep scholarly knowledge of this. Um, I know Corinna Zaltzman, I don't know if she's here today. She has just written a wonderful book on printing in Mexico in the, um, I think early 20th century. So that would be one of the places I would talk to you to answer some, turn to to answer some of those questions. Great, we have another uh, question from Reina. What is something you would like to incorporate or invite into your current radical practice? Oh. Um, that's a great question, Reina. It's pretty broad. <laughs> I would like more opportunities to learn from folks in the global South. I think uh, so, there's obviously can be such a huge language divide and there's also just this like commonly held uh, idea that knowledge radiates from the global north down to the global south and not the other way around and so I think we really need more spaces where we can learn from folks in the global south and I think language justice can play an important role in facilitating that. TK, um, I do have a, I have a shirt, I have a, like a, a question about, so I'm curious how you came about discovering the, the existence of these, um, these kind of independent kind of underground radical publishers, but also how are those early conversations with these organizers that eventually came to speak at UCLA and how they felt partnering with an institution like UCLA, right, implicated as it, as it is in, in so many of I think what they're pushing against in a lot of their practices. So I'd be curious, like the like the the the, the beginning of this project, even before right you started at, at at the beginning of this talk. Like, how did that come to be? Um, well, honestly, I've been friends with Sol and Diego for a really long time. I've known Sol since two thousand and seven, um, and. So she's just been a friend. She's who I stay with in Mexico City. And obviously we're both nerds in different ways. Um, you know, I work with books in the library. She works with texts that she translates. So we had a lot of natural affinity there. And so her being invited is just like, I finally had the opportunity to bring her into, bring her work into something that I was involved in. Um, in the case of Diego, that was actually pretty serendipitous. He came to UT Austin back in 2014 to give a talk about this uh, revolutionary family legacy that he has. And he came to talk to myself and the director of the Latin American Studies Institute about the possibility of collaborating on the Flores Magón archive. And it didn't end up working out, but Diego and I stayed in contact. And later I learned that he is childhood best friends with Sol. And so we, whenever I would go to Mexico City, then we would spend time together. I got to know his work that way. And um, when I came to, well, 
so here's the thing. I lived in Mexico city for my Fulbright. I lived in the same building as Sol. Like I lived with her neighbors. And so we spent a lot of time together and her partner is part of Crater Invertido, which is this really important artist collective. And they're all just connected to all these people doing these radical publishing projects. And so I was already, fam that's what made it possible to do this acquisition strip. It was just like, oh, I already know where to find these people. I know who to ask uh, about how to get connected with folks. And so everything just kind of fell into place. But it's, a, again, it goes back to these longstanding relationships um, that, you know, maybe didn't develop with this in mind, but serendipitously end up there. Thank you. I have a follow-up, but I'm going to defer to the others in the room just in case. I didn't answer your second part of the question, which was how did folks feel about partnering with the large institution? This is something that I actually asked a few of them recently because I was curious, like, what do you think the role is for these large Global North institutions in supporting work such as yours that is autonomous? Um, like, how do we not replicate these colonial dynamics? And Diego posed the question to me in a really helpful way, I think, was he's like, you know, we're not never going to get rid of the power dynamics in these relationships. So I think the question is, how can we leverage whatever resources we have to support the autonomy of the people that we're working with? And I really appreciate that as a guiding question. Yeah, indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jeannie in the chat offered a sort of response. Thank you for, quote, how do we prioritize relationships over collecting, end quote, if I got that right, looking for how we can use our institutional resources and become better partners with our communities to support and celebrate the artists who reflect creativity and cultural heritage that enriches our lives and becomes our shared legacy. Yeah, Jeannie, I, I completely agree. And that's definitely an approach that I try to take when I do these archival partnerships. Um, how can we use institutional resources to support the work that's already a priority for the people that we're working with? Uh, and finally, we have a question from Susan, Dr. Allen. When did when you did the acquisitions trip, and how did you think uh, what you were collecting would be used? So I don't have a lot of public service responsibilities or any public service responsibilities at UCLA. So I really follow the lead of Jenna Sorio, who's a librarian for Latin American studies. Um, she does a lot of classroom instruction. I know she has a lot of the non um, or a lot of the Latin American artist books that we have are because she purchased them. So I know she uses them in her work. And obviously with uh, CalRBS, being at UCLA, I think we were also hoping that there could be kind of larger or broader use through, through CalRBS Cal classes as well. I think we also wanted to have the collection as a reason to invite artists to UCLA as well, to do collaborations with folks here on campus in the larger community and the collections would be a really great pretext for that. I think I will interject with the one last question. Oh, I'll let um, Sam attend to the comment first. Sure, yeah, we have a couple of comments, one from Devin, it's notable that the BSA is only an institution in a fairly loose sense. So in the case of the series, it was a scholarly society rather than a single place. And then Jeannie adds, I'm inspired by those who use words and artist books as weapons of equity and freedom and by your journey and the path that you created, TJ. Thank you for the kind words, Jeannie. And shout outs to BSA because for their support of this series, it was really incredible to, to have uh, to work with them. And then, and just really quickly, TK, so I'm sure that as people are listening, listening to you, you know, talk about these experiences that you've had and the partnerships that you created and um, the programming. How would you recommend other people in institutions proceed if they want to kind of facilitate these kinds of community collaborations, right? Because we, I think we can all imagine the thousand reasons why it would be difficult to do so, right? 
we all work in institutions, but how, how can we maybe um, work internally to facilitate these kinds of connections? So I don't, I think this is somewhat related to your question, Rob, but one thing that I was thinking about is the challenge that came up through the acquisitions trip was it worked because we were down there in Mexico City, we could directly talk with people and purchase things from them. But once we left, there was no way to sort of systematize acquisition in the same way that you would with your regular book vendors. We explored, you know, teaming up with like maybe like a larger bookstore who would could potentially like purchase some of these materials and then send it to us. But we didn't actually find a good candidate for that because as I think this talk has demonstrated, it really requires a lot of work slash time to build the relationships with people um, and gain access to these materials. And so that type of work isn't scalable in large institutions and thus is not prioritized. And I, I wonder, would we get to a point where we would shift our collection development practices to maybe not prioritize like bulk, um, but prioritize, you know, very like targeted things as a result of the relationships that we build around them. I don't know if that's possible if we're moving in that direction. Um, but I do think that a lot of this work is only possible because of personal connections. Like one thing that stood out to me was at every single talk, no fail, someone asked, where can I get your stuff? And every single speaker was like, email me. <laughs> like we're like one person, like already even said, we're, we're terrible salespeople. <laughs> um, so they, they're not prioritizing online commerce in a way that, you know, we, you know, we take for granted here in the U S. So if like, Will institutions shift in order to actually diversify their collections or are they just looking for easy ways to diversify their collections? I don't know. I think that's something we need to work on. Thanks, TK. Yes, thank you, TK. We are unfortunately at time, um, but I wanna thank you again so much for this talk. Um, and I wanna thank all of the audience members today who came and, and viewed it. Um, this is the final installment of our speaker series. So thanks so much for, for joining us this season. If you missed either of the first two talks, the first was uh, by Devin Fitzgerald and the second by Calardius director, Rob Montoya, who just spoke. Uh, those are live on our YouTube page as will this talk be shortly. Um, so please do feel free to check those out. Um, and thank you again. Thanks so much. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.